There's a quote from the Dalai Lama about ripples. Just as they spread out when a single pebble is dropped into water, the actions of individuals have far-reaching effects. The far-reaching effects of Jennifer L. Nelson? Playwright, actor, director, arts administrator, and producer are still rippling through the DC theater scene. The two-time Helen Hayes Award winner empowered people in the margins and transformed a coalition of artists into a full producing theater company. She also launched careers while being a pioneer in hip hop theater. And to think a call nearly 50 years ago set these things in motion. Up until that call in the early 70s, Jennifer was pursuing her MFA at UC Davis in Northern California. I met Jennifer in 1969 when I went to graduate school in, at, at, at uh, UC Davis in uh, Northern California. So we were in the theater department together and it was, you know, it was the 60s and early 70s and it was kind of freewheeling and um, the graduate, the, the students had a lot to say about what went on in that department. But um, Jennifer and I just really hit it off from early on. Um, sense of humor, a, a real shared sense of humor, which is still to this day, that ties us together. She went off, then, then we sort of went our separate ways. I, um, she went to San Francisco, I went to Tacoma, Seattle, Washington to teach and direct. And, uh, and she went to act. We were in San Francisco at a funny time. It's before uh, a lot of little things were just starting, but there was a funny feeling in San Francisco. The stakes were extremely small for theaters. There were only a few theater companies that were operating, you know, these ensembles. The Mime Troupe being being the, the big one of everybody. And then I think the Blake Street Hawkeyes started up and they had people like Sam Shepard and the guys we think of as the big sort of 70s guys now. And no theater company liked any other theater company. <laughs> it was it was so competitive. It was like if you were in a play at Theater of Man, nobody from the other companies would come see you. If you were in a play at the Firehouse, the other companies would diss you. I mean, it was a really kind of, it wasn't a great theater scene because it was so small. And I think, I think that was one of the things that made people like Jennifer and me and our other friend, Jim Devney, just be kind of frustrated that you had to pledge your allegiance to one of these groups or else that was it. And you sure don't get that feeling so much on the East Coast. And then getting a professional gig is like really, you know, a whole new world, which I think was the next step up from what we were doing in San Francisco. Robert Alexander, founder of the Living Stage Theater Company, called Jennifer and offered to bring her to DC for an audition. She jumped at the opportunity, got the part, and worked at Living Stage for 26 years. We were roommates for the first year that I was at Living Stage. We lived in these apartments in Southwest, near the theater for the first half of the year. was like being thrown into the ocean, you know, <laughs> and learn to swim, but also learning about everything else that's in the ocean at the same time. And where do I do this? And how do I do this? And how do I stay alive, et cetera? We were, we, the, the, the work schedule was uh, kind of like being in the army. We worked six days a week. We never had downtime. Uh, we had homework every night and then twice as much on our day off. The entire rehearsal period, which was eight weeks, I believe, I don't think I ever left Southwest. 
While at Living Stage, Jennifer got involved with social activism and community involvement. Living Stage brought live theater to a population less likely to step into Arena Stage, which housed the company. Living Stage did a residency, a seven week residency in Boston. We did several performance workshops at Massachusetts State Prison. And we also did performance workshops at Lorton Reformatory. We did workshops for a number of halfway houses in DC. But all of these things, I was working alongside of Jennifer. When I came in, I was stunned by her incredible ability to capture nuance in character work. And because we were exploring the lives of marginalized peoples, it was an education for me to really see people flower, blossom, as they saw themselves created on stage by Jennifer. Jennifer was incredibly precise and specific in really opening up the heart of the person that she was playing on stage. And it connected directly to those audiences. I'm, I'm talking audiences as varied as preschool audiences to men in prison, to teenage moms, to folks in wheelchairs, to senior citizens in a senior citizen home. She was able to really speak to each one of them as if she knew them. And I always was taken by that. You can still do things in your life. A person can still do things in their lives that brings dignity and hope, not only to themselves, but to the other people, the people that they touch, you know, as they go th through their daily lives. During this time, Jennifer wrote, directed, and produced her play, Torn from the Headlines, which earned her a Helen Hayes and the Charles MacArthur Awards for Best New Play in 1997. My friend, my best friend, Dee Monroe, who was an actor, he was nominated for a Helen Hayes Award uh, this particular year for having done this play called Torn from the Headlines that Jennifer wrote. But I met her for sure that night at the Helen Hayes Awards. I wanted to make, she won that year for Best New Play. She was somebody that I absolutely wanted to meet. She's just a dynamic individual that, because I, I, I remember her speech when she gave, when she won the award, and I was like, I was blown away. I needed to meet her. It, it, she, I was like, I want to work with her. I didn't know anything, but I, except that, that I wanted to work with her. When she left Living Stage, it didn't take long for Jennifer's career to flourish at the African Continuum Theater Company, known as ACTCO. Founded in 1989 by John L. Moore III, ACTCO provided space for people of the African diaspora to produce, perform, and create theater. It's also where she met Deidre Lewan Starnes. She's the one person that I can say is responsible for my career in this area. She will cast me against type. She has cast me against what an artistic director wanted. She has fought for me. She has fought for my right to be a spiritual being in a show where she has advocated for us to come in a little later on Sunday, so people who go to church. At ADCO, Jennifer taught the group how to operate like a business, which included finding grants and sticking to budgets. At one point, uh, African Continuum Theater was a coalition and, you know, they brought artists together and they provided resources for uh, black theater and black theater artists. And Jennifer transformed it into a producing theater where they were actually producing plays. Um, and in doing that, uh, it wasn't a, a union theater, it was a non-equity theater and they would get guest contracts from equity to use equity actors but what she did was she hired so many artists who weren't in the union 
and catapulted their career. So there are so many people that started in productions with Jennifer who are now in the union and now just well known in the theater community. Jennifer's impact also hit on a personal level. I wanna talk about the kind of mom Jennifer was and I think in order for her to be so great at teaching me how to be a good mom artistically, she had to know how to do it herself. I quite literally grew up in theaters <laughs> across the district in LA, underneath rehearsal tables, in the back of the house, doing my homework in the green room, you know, that kind of lifestyle. Lots of stage managers, particularly at Living Stage, were my first babysitters. I used to get picked up from school in a big red Living Stage bus in elementary school. Um, so certainly there was uh, a model of how to incorporate your child into your career. I think she also learned from how, how challenging it really was to have a child and still pursue your passion, especially as a single parent. And she used that to apply forward when she had the power to make that a little bit easier for folks who were in her orbit. Jennifer was a mom to me as well. The way she talked to me, the advice that she gave me, and very helpful in teaching me how to be a mom who was also an artist and how to make sure that I was able to put my baby first but still let the artist in me live and I love that about her. In the late 90s, the term hip hop theater coined by London-based dancer and MC John Z. D. also emerged. In the summer of 2000, Jennifer helped start one of the first hip hop theater festivals as ADCO's artistic director, she produced the Hip Hop Theater Fest at the Kennedy Center, which brought audiences new to hip hop together with those familiar with the art form. These festivals helped kickstart the careers of artists like Tony Blackman. When Jennifer believed in me enough to commission me to co-write the Nightmares piece with Sama Yemi and to be the idea generator for a lot of the content, it boosted my confidence. It was like a working affirmation that somebody I respected and admired that much admired me as well and could see my potential. She was the one doing the heavy lifting for so many of us and who started so many of us off. Alexander Strain, Mark Harrison, both in The Whipping Man, young actors who had breakthrough performances in that 2012 production. Alexander would go on to just put together one sterling performance after another in production after production. Mark Harrison went up to NYU, got his graduate degree. Now he's a leading director as well as a fine actor and dancer. I just know in those young people, she loved working with them, she believed in them, and I think she gave them a tremendous burst to go forward in the profession. She's a very smart director, and you don't even know what she's pulling out of you because she has a way to get things out of you. She asks questions to make you think more about your character and more about the decisions that you've made in the process. I know that Jennifer Nelson is one of the reasons why I'm able to do the things that I do now. Jennifer Nelson is one of the reasons why I, when I got the call from the State Department to do work as the first official hip hop ambassador, that I felt comfortable taking it. I started writing poetry when I was eight years old. It's always been in me. But when I got to college, I let people talk me out of majoring in the School of Fine Arts. It was still lying dormant. So I did it on my own and I produced shows and I put together shows, but never on the scale of African Continuum Theater Company, never on the scale of working with someone like Jennifer Nelson, who then took our piece to the arena stage, a premier performance venue. After 11 years at ATCO, Jennifer went to Theater J to help produce The Whippy Man. 
She left in 2014 when Theater J fired their longtime artistic director, Ari Roth, who hired her. Jennifer had been hired by me at Theater J to direct a second production two years after she had directed The Whipping Man. This new play that she was going to be giving a DC premiere to was called The Call by another black female writer named Tanya Barfield. And we were slated to produce that play in the spring of 2015. We had been through auditions together. We had hired a great company. There were great actors. But there I was, out of a job at Theatre J by December 2014. The firing from Theatre J aroused a lot of response from artistic directors around the city, around the country, even internationally. It became like a whole big deal. 120 artistic directors signing a letter of protest and endorsement. I got to announce the birth of a new theater company the day after the acts came down. Jennifer and I ran into each other at a New Year's Eve party at the home of Tim Getman. Around the table, picking up food at the buffet line, Jennifer said, I don't think I can st stay at that place. This was 12 days after I'd been fired. I'm not gonna direct that play. Jennifer was a truly loyal colleague and a truly loyal friend. Jennifer decided she was gonna quietly, not with big fanfare, quietly step down from the directing position of the call at Theater J. And her entire cast followed suit. When he started the Mosaic Theater Company in 2015, he brought on Jennifer as founding resident director. In the last show that she did for Mosaic on the main stage uh, was a play called Milk Like Sugar that Jennifer was so excited about. Here's Jennifer in a clip from the Mosaic Theater Company talking about directing Milk Like Sugar in the future or don't see themselves in the future. They don't necessarily have images of other people like them who achieve something in life other than having babies and you know, leading these very commercialized lives like you see on television a lot. Shopping is you know, like a major hobby nowadays for a lot of young people. So I, I think the play gives a message that there are other options, and through the main character in particular, who starts out as just one of the girls who's ready to do the same things that they do. But as the play goes along, she, her, her mind is opened, and she starts seeing that, that there may be other possibilities for her in the future, although it's very difficult for her to get to them. Jennifer left Mosaic to assume the life of a freelancer, during which she pursued a fellowship at Ford's Theater. She earned her second Helen Hayes Award in 2019, 20 years after winning her first for her play, Torn From the Headlines. This time, the Helen Hayes Award was for Jennifer's decades of determination to allow marginalized voices to be heard on stage. We selected Jennifer for the Helen Hayes Awards because she is such an icon in the community. I mean, the award is there to, for people who have contributed greatly to the community, who have lit the path, and Jennifer is the definition of community. You know, she's always been available to actors, to teachers. She created ways in which people really work together in profound ways. And she's been in the community, you know, for decades. In addition to the many hats Jennifer wore behind the scenes, she was also an accomplished educator who taught on nearly every campus in the DC metropolitan area, including American University, Georgetown, George Washington, the University of Maryland, and Virginia Commonwealth College. Her work has always consisted of being of service, being of uh, 
legacy and uh, recognizing where we come from, where we have come from, in order to, you know, pursue where we're headed. And she showed me how lyrics can become performance. That I can honor my creativity, that I can honor my voice and the way the stories come out of me. And I don't have to fit it into the Western definition of what is theater and what is performance. All of that is big. All of that is impactful. All of that is about fulfilling, fulfilling my destiny. And that is because Jennifer Nelson has the capacity to see you so that you can then see yourself. When the tribe gathers around the fire to retell the hunting story, to relive how the blood was spilled, how Jojo braved the lion's wrath and struck the final blow. When the women sit spellbound on the fringes, awed by the warrior's prowess, I want to be in the center, holding the arrow, hurling the spear. I want to sing the heart of the magic, how we slew the hunted, we skinned the beast, we turned violence into life, and we rejoice in our aliveness. When the people gather around the fire, I want to burn. I want to be the flame.